Hello, my name is uh, Marc Marc Fleury. Uh, I am a French Spanish uh, citizen by birth, uh, born and raised in Paris and lived in Madrid many years. Moved to the United States in the early 90s for a PhD in physics. I uh, did the work at MIT. Uh, then I left academia after my PhD, went to Silicon Valley uh, early on, working on Java uh, language and early internet layers and middleware. Uh, did a company called JBoss that I sold in uh, 2006 uh, to Red Hat in open source and uh, retired uh, young and uh, that's it. Excellent. How, um, how did you find about Montpellier? Funny story, I was on a plane to a conference in Malta and uh, sitting in business class and a young man called uh, Arnaud Salomon uh, sits next to me and we start talking about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. And, uh, I'd heard a little bit about Montpellier and uh, talking with uh, Arnaud I found very interesting and that's, uh, that's how I really got involved with Montpellier. Excellent. So how, what, what uh, marked you at first with the project and uh, its ambition? What marked me at first is uh, as, a, as an investor, um, I start with, uh, first of all, the field. And even though the word Bitcoin and blockchain are dark words nowadays and nobody wants to touch it, um, I think in cryptocurrencies in general, the world of securitization um, is uh, very interesting. The capacity to take existing assets, new assets, um, and, uh, and create sec digital securities that can be exchanged on other venues than the traditional venue uh, is very interesting to me. As a private investor, uh, I always shied away from private equity that locks you up for many years and charges you outrageous fees for many, many years. And uh, even with the phenomenon of the ICOs, which were this creation of tokens but with no value behind, there was a tremendous uh, monetary movement. Uh, it's the financial characteristics that interest me first and foremost. So to me, the whole uh, securities world uh, on, on blockchain is very, very attractive in terms of the financial characteristics. So the first thing that attracted me is the, the field itself. Now within it, I pay attention to the team. Uh, and uh, so I researched a bit. And called some friends uh, who had heard about you and uh, about Montpellier. And, uh, and so I like young entrepreneurs that are ambitious and uh, with a clear vision. So that was the second thing. Being an IT person yourself in your background and having a very strong career in this domain, can you go deeper on what you saw about the technology of Montpellier, especially from the op open source perspective that, uh, that you have? Sure. Um, I can speak generically and, and then maybe a bit about Montpellier in particular. Um, the first thing that strikes me in the cryptocurrency world is that today there is a big emphasis on technology. Um, it's all Silicon Valley. You know, cryptocurrency is about Silicon Valley. The investments happen in Silicon Valley. But the more time I spend uh, in the field, the more I realize this is more about Wall Street and indeed even Washington in the US than it is about Silicon Valley. And what I mean by that is that the truly interesting characteristics to me are the market liquidity, the fact that as an investor, a private investor, I'm not locked up for many years in a VC structure until liquidity, but you have continuous liquidity with the tokens just like the ICOs have proven and now being discredited because they had no value, but the monetary aspects of it were were very interesting. The second aspect of it, we're talking about open source, was the fact that Bitcoin um, as a network does not have one person in charge. It is truly a decentralized open source uh, entity uh, going on. And I find that a little bit lost in the current zeitgeist of cryptocurrency. It's all this company, that company, and that's great, but um, 
being an, an IT professional, I saw up and close um, the 2000, the 97, 99 time frame where uh, after HTML and HTTP standard protocols were released to the public, you had a hundred companies trying to come up with the next standard for, for, for the infrastructure of the internet. And by definition of the infrastructure of something as big as the internet, you don't want one person in charge. And so it becomes a game theory problem. If you have everybody around the table and say, use my standard, no, use my standard, why should we use your standard? Well, because it's my standard. Why should we use your standard? Well, because I make money on my standard. What ends up happening is nobody moves, uh, and so nothing gets done. And it took, uh, at the time, some microsystems, IBM, to some degree Oracle, all the BIT players, to really get around the table and create a standard uh, so that all the actors could get into the standard. What they missed at the time was the open source nature of the standards. And what has come to pass in the history of IT, if you look today at the infrastructure of the internet, is that it's open source and standards together that truly create a public domain uh, infrastructure that everybody can use. In the case of Mont Pelerin, there is a lot of technology uh, that is being developed with a pledge to put it in open source, uh, with a pledge to make it open, and maybe with a eye of getting standards going, although I'll say, not to sound negative, but really more our timelines evolve and when the opportunity lies, it's so early in the world of digital securities um, that rushing for standards may not make a lot of sense right now. We need to experiment what works and what not. I think we're getting a good idea. And at the end of the day, it's not so much about the tech that we would standardize in open source. It's again about these market characteristics of cryptocurrency, the liquidity of it, the speed of it, the automation of it, uh, the fact that blockchain guarantees transparency and editability is interesting as well. Um, and so the open source principles apply more than open source tech, if that makes sense, meaning the idea that you have a community building infrastructure together. Okay, interesting. D do you see particular challenges to the, short-term challenges to the development and progress of, of this regarding the blockchain? Um, well, <coughs> I think you have we have two great examples of success, uh, two applications, um, killer apps, if you would. Uh, one in Bitcoin and derivatives, sort of the speculative store of value. So you have these tokens that don't really represent any intrinsic value, although they have use as, uh, as they have some uses. Um, the, 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 the Bitcoin success is really a psychological gambling, if you would. Um, the second uh, success to me has been Ethereum and the phenomena of ICOs. Even though it has died, <coughs> and for good reasons, many of the ICOs were not asset-backed. Many of the ICOs did not have equity coming into them. It was just a token that was being emit emitted, the whole utility token thing. Um, and so the first opportunity um, that we see in the third movement of securities, what we're dealing with here at Mont Pelerin, is that we can issue these tokens but have them backed by real value. And so we're in the slightly paradoxical situation that if today you say, and by today I mean uh, January 2019, uh, if you say Bitcoin and blockchain, uh, doors get closed. It has a bad reputation somehow. When, in fact, uh, uh, the, 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 the promise of digital security is like investment banking for everybody, uh, uh, crowdfunding is, is, as we know it today, uh, is going to evolve into this massive liquidity, these huge exchanges way beyond what Bitcoin and blockchain uh, have achieved. Um, uh, that's the real uh, opportunity in my mind. So the main challenge to me, um, is a psychological one. Um, the tech is interesting, the tech is powerful. The idea that nobody owns these ledgers is very, very interesting and even on a society level important. The idea that 
uh, that, that, that data such as identity, voting, social, medical, would exist on, on blockchain belonging to the individual is very powerful. But for the near term, it is really about the introduction of these uh, securities uh, and the challenge is psychological one that even within the domain, and th the problem is if you talk to specialists in blockchain and you go to conferences, we tend to talk our own language. Nobody can understand us. We've become so uh, resonant with each other in a good way. I mean, it's good that it advances, but somebody who has not spent the last year listening to this crap is going, what are you guys talking about? So it's a linguistic, psychological, because language changes psychology. You know, right now you say Bitcoin, or you say Ethereum, and people think gambling and ICOs, meaning things that, eh, speculation and ICOs. When in fact, it can change profoundly uh, access to capital for both issuers and, and investors, uh, and, and promises to, to revolutionize uh, finance and probably economy uh, as a result. Um, uh, Marx, Karl Marx, uh, talked about um, uh, abundance and participatory economies, like we are now modeling with tokens. And his, his, uh, his, uh, his precept was according to each one, according to their capacity. That mind shift in, as an individual, I can emit a token, and if I have an asset back in it, and I pay back my token value, um, that's not the dominant zeitgeist today in the Bitcoin world. So I think the challenge to, to answer your question is not about tech, the opportunities in finance and financing, but the challenge is really, first of all, that the Bitcoin guys are still convinced that it is about tokens for gambling or utility tokens, ICO, even though it's evolving rapidly to the securities world. And on the other end, um, the, the fact that people need to adopt this technology to go to market and, and, and market these tokens. Uh, I like to say, you know, it, it's funny, when we talk about that to Silicon Valley types, they go, oh, it's not about tech, I'm not interested. But as a technologist, I consider it a really bad database. It's just the worst database we could imagine, and we burn 1% of the planet to basically secure tax evasion for the masses. Uh, I'm being facetious. Uh, but when you talk to Wall Street types, or even Washington types, I mean, politicians, and you talk to them about the applications of public finance, in, in tokenization of public finance, which today is a very interesting game, just as a way of example, uh, imagine a pyramid, uh, that's the muni bond market in the United States, the municipal public financing, muni bonds. It's a $15.15 trillion dollar asset class uh, where the primary issuance, meaning the, 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 the first line of issuance, is very efficient. The secondary market is a 15% margin uh, rigged. So the top of the pyramid is, and then, you know, even as a private investor, I don't participate in many bonds anymore. They make no little sense, a little yield. Um, but if you just take that one example, you know, you realize that even the applications to public financing I, the issuance of, 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 of the bonds and the, and the buying of them, uh, that could be completely revolutionized on, on something like this in, in a securitized world. Um, and so the psychology is more primed in Wall Street and Washington for the next step of the evolution than it is in Silicon Valley in a way, and I find that very intriguing. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that it's kind of a split between the cryptocurrency going in one direction and the technology, the blockchain going to another, which is more focused on other use case of the application, like you said, and in the end it's going to become kind of two markets? Or Well, you know, there's so much opportunity in the, um, in, in the field that I tend to focus on what I believe in. And I strongly believe in the securitized world. Uh, here and so, you know what the others are doing. I don't care. I mean, obviously there's a lot of uh, altcoins still being put out there, or stores of value, or speculative gambling with no assets backing them, just the pure chains, and that's interesting and that's a value, you know. And what is it, 200 billion right now, which is nothing. It's small. You know, Facebook is at 600, whatever. They're, they're, they're small numbers. I think the SEO phenomena has died. 
So that application as financing uh, a new concern, I think, has completely died, and for good reason. But what it has proven, what both have proven, the Bitcoin and the Ethereum, the, the, the altcoins and the, and, and, and the ICOs, is that you can create liquidity <laughs> and you can create money as long as you back it up with something real, uh, it is primed to explode. So I follow what some of the alt currencies are doing. That's always interesting. My favorite um, bar in judging what's going on is Dogecoin, you know, the doggy coin, uh, because it's so absurd. You know, it's a joke. It was born as a joke. Let's put a name that doesn't mean anything. And it's still worth, I don't know, 100, 200 million? I, I haven't followed where it's at these days. Probably, I don't even know. Um, or even something closer to, to what I do, because I'm involved with IoT, uh, with a company called Open Remote. We're pursuing smart city financing through, through securities and digital securities uh, to finance smart city infrastructure. We do that out of the Netherlands, uh, here in Europe, and we want to move it to the US. Uh, if you look at IOTA, IOTA, it's a very interesting coin, but it's a pure investment coin. And out of that, they're trying to develop some IoT expertise. Do I need a blockchain to record the data that comes from the traffic lights or the sewers? Maybe, maybe not. Supply chain applications, possible. You know, and they're not uninteresting. But the tech is not the central part to me. Uh, even though we need a good blockchain, and IOTA blockchains will probably do just fine for the records and the database. But it's really everything around it, what it enables, the psychology of how we go about the financing, the liquidity of the tokens that we've bought, that are truly opening many, many opportunities. So in the other spaces, there is a fork. Some people will focus on, 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 on gambling tokens, basically, or stores of value, if you want to call them that way, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. Everybody has slight different characteristics, but it's all store of value with different different propositions. Utility tokens are s seeming to die really quickly, but you know what people are doing with the tech there, I don't really care. Uh, but what's going on in the securities world is very interesting to me. Uh, because again, really big numbers, Wall Street gets it, Washington gets it, you're going to see regulation just letting that happen as opposed to the pushback on the current cryptocurrencies. Uh, and so, you know, infinity out of that, uh, whatever will come, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what, the, what that more financial approach to things will bring, and which is why I was so interested in Montpellier, because I think having an extremely clean Swiss legislation, Swiss compliant license, da da dee da da da, in opposition to the free for all that we've had before where anything goes. You know, well, that's very interesting because out of nothing will come something really interesting, I think. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome.